In this film, the first of a short series, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to Dr. Jen Curtin, a specialist in ME-CFS and associated structural disorders. What exactly are craniocervical instability, the Chiari malformation, and tethered cord? How common are they in ME-CFS? And does the same apply to long COVID? And just how might a COVID infection bring on conditions like these? Hope you find it helpful. Hi, Jen. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was wondering if we could just start off by, uh, if you could just fill us in with a little bit of your um, your history and how you came to be involved in this field and what kind of work you do now. My background, I'm an internal medicine physician. Um, I actually had ME-CFS for about nine years and I was lucky enough to go into remission with a lot of treatments. So that was a big part of the reason I went through medical training was trying to kind of figure out what was wrong with me um, and ultimately was able to with the help of a lot of amazing people. You know, I also have POTS and I have joint hypermobility. So I have a lot of the things that I treat in my patients. I kind of went through that journey of, you know, a lot of blank stares and, oh, nothing's wrong with you. Or even some people saying there is something wrong with you, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, you know, really going through that ever since I finished residency in 2016, I've been treating patients with these complex chronic illnesses. And then um, pretty quickly into the pandemic, I started having long COVID patients come to my clinic. And, you know, I was noticing a lot of overlap between the conditions, even if they weren't necessarily the same thing. Um, and then I, at this point, I co-founded a, um, a telehealth company called Rhythm to try and see if we can basically learn a lot more of these about these illnesses and what works for whom, create a system that's a lot more scalable that can get out to a lot more people at a much lower price point because there's still such a diagnostic delay. Um, and that's something I would love to be able to change. Just give us some idea of how common anatomical problems are in diseases like MECFS and long COVID. The, there are differing amounts of literature even on the prevalence of this stuff in MECFS. There's one uh, paper, I think it was out of Karolinska Institute, and um, they were talking about how it's actually shockingly common in the MECFS patients that they had seen. Um, I think I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was it was like above 50 percent, if I remember. Um, and, you know, there was some thought that, well, maybe that's a selected population that's going to that clinic. So maybe you guys have a higher percentage of people with that kind of structural condition that's being found. But, you know, it's something that I've seen in quite a few patients. Not all of them have it for sure, but um, I've seen it in a fair, fair number. I don't think we have numbers yet for uh, long COVID. So if we just sort of go back up to a sort of a very sort of headline level, could you describe uh, what the differences are between some of these structural issues um, and what the primary ones are that you see in your practice? So the first one um, I wanted to go over was just Arnold Carey malformation. Typically it's type one, um, type two and three tend to be seen pretty early in, in very young kids. And um, so essentially here, this is a picture of the brain sliced through off the side. And the cerebellum is this blue part right here. And in um, Curie malformation, the cerebellum is actually sort of shifted down and it's poking through. So the, the base of the skull, if you look over here, so these are the tips of the base of the skull here. They have, a, they have a very kind of interesting names. But if you draw a line across that, this is the cerebellum. And you can see here, it's poking down below that opening. And so when that part of the cerebellum kind of herniates down out the bottom of your skull, this part here is actually your brainstem. Part of your brainstem actually comes out just a little bit below the bottom of your skull. And so that can make for very, very cramped quarters. And generally speaking, the nervous system tissue is very soft. It doesn't like to be squished. You know, nothing about squishing your brain or your spinal cord is a good thing. And um, so also there's CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, that bathes your entire brain and almost acts kind of like, in a way, padding. Um, your brain's sort of like suspended in your skull, it's like floating in a big bone fishbowl of sorts. And when, but there's a big flow of that fluid down around your spinal cord, all the way down and then back up and around, and it gets reabsorbed back up in your head. So when you have, you can almost think of, do you remember those drains where um, they used to have this little plunger uh, and it was like a little rubber kind of ball and it would just like plug into the drain and plug it. That's kind of like what's happening. So if you imagine like your head is just a big sink full of water 
and there's a drain in the bottom, when your cerebellum kind of herniates through, it's like putting a plug into that hole. So then at all the pressure, the water just kind of builds up and builds up and builds up and you can have higher pressure inside of your head. You can have, and that can lead to various symptoms and things like that. Um, and then also there would be lower pressure and less CSF getting down around your spinal cord in some cases, depending on how plugged that drain is. Another one is um, cranial cervical instability. And I'm using the same image as Chiari because it does actually show the person's um, spinal cord or their uh, medulla is like kinked over the front of their skull. Um, but cranial cervical instability, you can have cervical medullary syndrome as a result of that. Um, and essentially here, you can kind of see this part. This is essentially like their brainstem and into the spinal cord. Do you see how there's like kind of this sharp angle right here where it's like kinked? Yeah. This is actually not supposed to be happening. And in this person, it's probably because the cerebellum is poking down through the bottom and it's shoving this part forward into the, the, this part of their skull. So essentially they're, you know, their poor, you know, uh, brainstem is just being smashed into the, this hard skull and kinked over it. So that does no good things. And kind of the last structural thing I'm going to cover, there's many more of these, but just these are kind of three of the big ones that tend to come up the most in the patients that I see. The other one is tethered cord syndrome. And um, so this is just a diagram of um, your cord basically kind of ends a little bit higher up in your, your spinal column than most of us would think. It's supposed to, you know, end pretty high up, especially if you're an adult. Um, and there's this... Um, basically something called the, the phylum terminale that everybody has one and it just, unless you've had it surgically removed. Um, and then essentially this kind of tethers the cord down, but it's supposed to be stretchy. So when you're a child, you know, you're not as tall. And as you grow, it allows your spinal cord to ascend up as you grow taller without tractioning the bottom of it. It needs to be able to kind of move freely up without much restriction. Um, and in some cases like this one, there's like scar tissue that's built up and it's that, that long stretchy tether has become kind of fused here. And so it can't move. And so in this case, that cord is being pulled down. And anytime you move, your spinal cord actually does kind of have some stretch to it. And so this poor person wouldn't really be able to like, you know, their, their spinal cord is being pulled on every time they try to do certain positions or movements, or if they walk in a certain way, or if it's bad enough that they just walk at all. Um, and this can lead to neurological findings. Um, a lot of times they affect the lower body pretty significantly, and but sometimes they can be very subtle. Um, and so that's the kind of thing is when they're subtle, it can be kind of like little signs and symptoms can be missed over time. And then suddenly you have to have high clinical suspicion to look for this. Um, so unless Yes. So, so, so with MECFS of these three, what is sort of the proportion? Which is the most common? Which is sort of the biggest? You know, most frequently seen in MECFS, and does it look like the same pattern is appearing with the long COVID patients you're seeing, or does it seem to be different? So, I don't know if I can say for long COVID yet because we're you know starting to really work people up for this, um, and the workup process really kind of takes a while. It's a process. Um, and so I don't have like definitive, real good answers on that yet. Um, in the MECFS patients that I've seen, um, I think I've probably seen, and this may just be bias based on my own patient population, because a lot of my patients who have either Chiari or craniocervical instability, we tend to also find tethered cord in them as well. And so they tend to have both. So I would say in my case, I've seen probably maybe the most tethered cord syndrome. Um, but I would say secondarily, cranial cervical instability, and then sometimes you can have all three. Here's a question that you might not have the answer for. Let's say that somebody has a little bit of Chiari or a little bit of CCI, um, and maybe does or doesn't have mild symptoms in their life. Then they catch COVID and they develop long COVID, and now it becomes a problem. Um, and even the same thing for viral or bacterially triggered sort of MECFS. 
do we know or are there any decent theories about what physically changes there with that infection to suddenly create the problem that was previously apart from as you say like the deconditioning from lying down the rest of it is there something to do with inflammation or something to do with the way that the body fights infection that can lead to these issues getting worse or i don't know if there's been much talked about on this subject there is there is theory around this and but it's not none of it's really confirmed yet so it's something that some i know like some surgeons are working on doing pathology from some of the kind of ligaments that they're you know they're able to take a small piece during a surgery and take a look at that you know under a microscope and start to figure out okay does this ligament look different how does it look different they're looking at things like are mast cells in or around the ligaments becoming activated and they're releasing compounds that actually degrade collagen. Is that part of what may be going on? Um, is there actually a translocation of, let's say, bacteria? If there's it's like a bad bacterial infection in your throat or something like that, um, is there actually a little bit of infection going on? Or the other thing is that ligaments generally don't have the greatest blood flow. Um, and so is there something where, let's say, the blood flow to that area has somehow been compromised. And so the ligament can't really repair itself and it just becomes weaker and thinner. Um, the other possibility as well is that um, because as, as I was saying before with the Grisel syndrome, um, generally that is, you know, initially triggered by uh, some kind of typically an infection in the back of the throat or the ears and the veins that drain that area drain back and they kind of communicate with this part of your upper neck. And, um, there have been accounts of actual infection that is transmitted back there and then established in the bones. Um, but also in some cases they haven't really found infection per se. It doesn't mean maybe there's something there we're not detecting, but also, as you can imagine, there's probably a lot of cytokines, inflammatory molecules, you know, enzymes released from local mast cells in the back of the throat, all kinds of things that would also be transmitted back through those veins. And the impact of those on the ligaments in the neck, we don't fully know yet, or at least I haven't, if, if it is known, I, I'm not aware of it. Um, and so it's, is it, is it something where it's an inflammation triggered thing by the, the um, connection between those two areas and something that was just kind of running around in, in my head. And I'm sure others in this area as well is the, you know, COVID, where does it go? It gets in through the nose and the, the mouth and so a lot of people get sore throats. So it's, it's in that area. That's why we swab there. Um, is that inflammation almost going to create kind of like a mild um, version of a Grisel syndrome? And, you know, we don't know for sure, but it is something that I, I, you know, I think some of us are kind of thinking about in the back of our heads. So it's just, what do we, you know, getting that data and getting it in enough numbers to where we can actually see if that's happening or not, um, that's going to be challenging. In the next film in the series, Dr. Asad Khan and I will dig deeper into the symptoms of these connected conditions and ask Dr. Curtin the best ways to work out if you might be at risk and what the red or green flags are for the condition. In the final film of the series, we'll discuss the necessary investigations, treatment and prognosis. One final quick plug, if you didn't know, I've written a book with Professor Danny Altman. People leaving reviews on Amazon seem to like it, and if you've got long COVID and feel like a singular resource bringing everything we've learned about the condition into one place would be helpful, then please do go check it out. It's available as an ebook, hard copy, and audiobook. Link is in the description. Look after yourselves, until next time.